Welcome back to Learn Neuroradiology, everyone. This is Brent Weinberg. Today we're going to talk about the second part of our spine tumor lecture. This lecture is going to focus on intramedullary lesions, so we're going to talk about lesions occurring within the spinal cord itself. If you haven't seen the first lecture, it's a great time to go back and check that out. But we're going to talk about lesions occurring within the spinal cord. The spinal cord is an extension, really, of the brain parenchyma itself. When you're looking at these, the most common things are masses. So you want to try to determine if there is a mass. And the most common of these tumors are pendymomas and astrocytomas. Other tumors, such as hemangioblastoma, particularly in the case of patients with von hippel lindau syndrome and cavernous malformations, can definitely appear in the spinal cord. You can also have mimics, such as inflammatory disease, demyelinating disease, and infarct. Uh, we're going to cover those at a lecture at a separate time. But really, the key to intramedullary lesions is seeing an expansion of the spinal cord where it's smoothly expanded, but the CSF space is not affected. On the axial image, it's going to look like a normal contour of the spinal cord. So here we're going to take a look at a case that's an intramedullary lesion. This is a 20-year-old male with back pain and lower extremity weakness. Uh, what you see here, you have a T2, and uh, this has fat saturation, and you see expansion of the cord. And you see the cord is expanded all the way really from the cervical medullary junction all the way down. It's a similar appearing on your T2 without fat saturation. But then on your post-contrast imaging, what you see is this is a partially enhancing lesion. So here in the lower cervical spine, you have some irregular enhancement, maybe some areas of central non-enhancement, kind of ill-defined margins, and all of this looks like it's expanding the cord. This is a case of a spinal cord astrocytoma. Uh, this particular one extends all the way up to the brain stem. This is another example here. You can see ill-defined enhancement in the cord kind of going up. In children or those like in the teenage years or younger, it's the most common cord tumor. In adults, it's uh, the second most common tumor and uh, the second most common overall. The cervical cord is the most common site. And most commonly, you're going to see an infiltrative process that's over multiple vertebral bodies. These can commonly have cystic areas or areas of non-enhancement, so be on the lookout for those as well. Now our second case, this is a 57-year-old uh, with a right deltoid weakness. Uh, this was incidentally found lesion seen after a car accident. Here you have, a, on the leftmost image, you have a T2 image. You see kind of a well-marginated T2 hyperintense lesion in the cervical cord. Maybe it has this little nodular area in the center that looks a little bit different, where your fat saturation doesn't really change the appearance of that at all. And here's your pre and post contrast images. So you have T1 hypointense region with that nodular area is kind of iso intense to the surrounding cord. On post contrast imaging, that uh, nodular area enhances pretty avidly. This is an example of what a spinal cord ependymoma looks like. Uh, you can see, like, this is another example of an ependymoma. You have cystic areas uh, with areas of nodular enhancement. Uh, these are the most common cord tumors in all takers, and particularly in adults. They frequently have areas of hemorrhage. Uh, this was a patient who has NF here, uh, who has a kind of this multifocal lesion with multifocal enhancement. Uh, ependymomas are kind of known for having this uh, kind of cystic or hemorrhage cap. You'll sometimes see that. Mixopapillary uh, ependymomas are a subtype of ependymomas that occur in the conus. Uh, the cellular ependymomas are the ones that appear elsewhere in the, in the spinal cord, so you'll see those elsewhere. Now, if you're taking a look at two very similar tumors, there's a lot of overlap between this imaging appearance. You're trying to consider, could it be an astrocytoma or an ependymoma? If you take a look at this, uh, the one on the left here, we have both uh, STIR images. And you're trying to figure out which one is which. If you have some of the features here, the one that looks like it has more well-defined margins is maybe this one on the left here. Maybe you have a little bit more of a well-defined nodule. Uh, here, the margins are a little bit more ill-defined, and uh, so that's uh, maybe a clue there. Also, you have the age of the patient, like this is a 41-year-old, this is a 22-year-old, so maybe in a younger patient, an astrocytoma is maybe a little, a little bit more common. Uh, if we, This is just the axial images through that area. They look very similar. You've just got uh, T2 hyperintense kind of expansion through, through that region. If you take a look at the enhancement pattern, however, you'll see this one on the left has a very smooth enhancement. 
very well-defined margins, kind of well-defined nodule. And here you have the more ill-defined enhancement, kind of uh, ill-defined margins. So you kind of uh, can think about really the enhancement pattern in this case may kind of trump the rest of your information. Uh, if you take that, this one on the left is your ependymoma. The one on the right is your astrocytoma. This one is a high-grade astrocytoma or, or GBM. And uh, so if you're considering astrocytoma versus ependymoma, the things that maybe help you are the age of the patient, so younger patients, children and teenagers, and that heterogeneous pattern of enhancement. Uh, the others uh, kind of have a lot of overlap. Maybe ependymomas are a little bit more central, a little bit more short segment, uh, but the homogeneous enhancement of that enhancement, enhancing nodule and the adult age of the patient really is your best clue. Now, this is a case of an intramedullary glioblastoma. You can see two patients. Uh, this is a 22-year-old. This is a 43-year-old. These are both glioblastomas within the cord. You can see, again, like ill-defined margins, areas of non-enhancing necrosis centrally. If you took this lesion and you put it uh, in, a, in the brain, you would uh, be definitely thinking about glioblastoma being on your differential. So anytime you run into trouble in the spine, you're looking at a tumor, think about if this lesion were in the brain, what would I believe that this is likely to be? These are examples of glioblastoma. These are a relatively small proportion of spinal cord tumors. They're most common in the cervical cord and they're common in younger patients. Uh, the mean survival is very poor. They really look like brain GBMs. They just happen to be in the spine. You definitely want to image the rest of the neuroaxis. So you want to take a look at the brain and the remainder of the spine to see if there is leptomeningeal disease elsewhere that you can see. Now here you see a similar uh, pattern of enhancement in the brain. This is a different patient with a right parietal GBM. You see this kind of uh, stippled enhancement centrally, enhancement around the margins, kind of ill-defined margins. You can see these are very similar. So when you see that, use that as your clue that that might be a GBM in the spinal cord. Now we're gonna move on. This is our third intermedullary case. Uh, here you see uh, you have a T2 image, an axial image, kind of through this central area. This is a T2 fat saturated image. So you see expansile abnormality expanding all the way from the lower medulla, uh, all the way into the upper uh, thoracic spine. Here you see it on T1 post contrast, it's predominantly low intensity, but you have an enhancing nodule centrally. This was a 40 year old with neck pain and progressive sensory symptoms. You can definitely see why that would be happening because the much of the cervical cord is uh, taken up by this tumor. This is a case of a hemangioblastoma. Uh, these are benign capillary rich tumors. They are common in patients who have von Hebel-Lindau, although two thirds of them are spontaneous or in patients without VHL. Uh, but the, typically the thing you see is a cystic area with a nodule that's the vascular nodule. Typically only the nodule has to be resected and a lot of the cystic area adjacent to it is really uh, can be a syrinx and a lot of that will improve. Now you may have the benefit of seeing some flow voids along the pia, but it can be really challenging to see, especially in the spinal cord where you don't necessarily get a lot, good look at the CSF space. Uh, so you may not see them as well as you do when you see them in the posterior fossa. Uh, this, though, is uh, the other findings of von Hebel-Lindau. Uh, so a lot of times what you'll see is the classic hemangioblastomas in the posterior fossa. So you'll see, again, a cystic lesion with a solid enhancing nodule. Uh, you can see endolymphatic sac tumors associated with them. So here you see the right temporal bone. Uh, the kind of sphenoid plate here is disrupted. You have disruption of the bone there with an ill-defined lytic lesion there. Here you see just some peel nodules from uh, hemangioblastoma spread uh, along the surface of the, the conus and uh, kind of thoracic spine here. Uh, so this is typically uh, the classic kind of findings that you can get with von Hebel-Lindau. In posterior fossa tumors in adults, hemangioblastomas are the most common primary uh, posterior fossa tumor. So think about that anytime you see a posterior fossa tumor in an adult. This is our fourth and final intramedullary case. Uh, this was a case of a 26 year old man. He's got sensory loss. He was having lower extremity weakness. Uh, he was in an MMA match. Uh, so what we see here is we have a T2 with uh, fat saturation here, at least partial fat saturation. You've got a lesion which is in the lower thoracic cord here. It's got a rim of T2 hypo intensity around it. Is centrally T2 hyperintense. This is your pre and post contrast imaging here. 
And uh, what you see is not a whole lot of uh, enhancement there. Uh, this one has a uh, fat saturation. You really just see like not a lot going on. Again, a T1 dark rim, kind of iso intense to the cord centrally within there. Uh, this is a case of a cavernous malformation. So of all cavernous malformations, about three to 5% of them occur in the cord. In patients that have familial cavernous malformation syndromes, they have more likely to have cord lesions. These can have a variable clinical course. If the patients are symptomatic, like these are typically resected. In this case, it was a kind of a red herring that this patient had been in an MMA match. Uh, here you see again, like that rim of T2 hyperintensity, not a lot of edema around it. And that might help differentiate it from, a, say, a traumatic contusion in this case, uh, because that was a, a well-defined lesion. This is another patient that has a cavernous malformation here. You see, in this case, it's much worse. You see these multiloculated kind of cystic areas with a hematocrit level here. Uh, you see a lot of hemosiderin deposited sort of throughout the cord. Uh, so this is a kind of a hemorrhage, uh, a cavernous malformation that's had a lot of hemorrhage. Now, if you see hematomalia, so anytime you see blood within the cord, you have a differential. You have to think about coagulation disorders, vascular malformations like this cavernous malformation that we saw, whether the patient's on anticoagulation, whether it's trauma, so a cord contusion, you can definitely see that, or whether there's a cord tumor such as an astrocytoma or a pendymoma that's causing uh, to hemorrhage sometimes. So this is your differential when you see a case of hematomyelia. So finally, like, what do you want to take away from this lecture about intermedullary spine lesions? First of all, you want to think about the spinal cord being an extension of the brain. If you're concerned and you don't know what uh, the pathology might be, think about if this lesion were in the brain, what would I think it is? The most common intermedullary lesions are tumors. In younger patients, they're more likely to be astrocytomas. In older patients, ependymomas, with that cutoff being in kind of the late teens to early 20s. Other parenchymal tumors can definitely happen there. We saw a couple of cases of glioblastoma. We saw a uh, hemangioblastoma. We saw cavernous malformations. So those are the other tumors that can occur there. So definitely keep those on your differential. Thanks for tuning into this lecture. If you enjoyed this lecture, be sure to tune in for the next lecture. In that lecture, we're going to talk about mimics of intermedullary tumors. So some things that can look like tumors that are not. Uh, other lectures in this uh, series are going to cover the other parts of the spine, so the extramedullary uh, intradural lesions and the extradural lesions. Uh, so be sure to like uh, the videos, subscribe to get notifications when the next videos come out, and be sure to check out the whole series. Thanks for tuning in today, and I uh, hope you enjoy the videos.